Hey everybody, it's your old pal John. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I'm the history buff, but like I said, you can call me John. Today we're going to be doing top 10 things America stole from Britain. And, um, yeah. I love reading the comments on these, uh, but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we do take a lot from, from you guys and claim it as our own if you're British and, and watching this. So, um... Let's get into it, and uh, I will probably be embarrassed. For this list, we're counting down famous facets of American culture. By the way, this is Watch Mojo UK. It's a great channel. I recommend subscribing. Which actually originated in Britain. While standout British inventions are subject for another list, today's countdown tackles typically American things, which the US has the UK to thank for. Okay. Number 10, Apple Pie. Yeah. <laughs> as American as apple pie, right? Wrong. The sweet treat is a staple on US dining tables, but the British were the first to serve it way back in the 1300s. A popular dessert throughout European history, with Dutch and Swedish styles also inspiring menus worldwide, it was taken across the pond with the 17th century colonists. Since then, apple pie has become a standout symbol of US patriotism, as well as a central component to a teen comedy franchise. It's not what it looks like. <laughs> Number nine. Yeah, that's a, so I have heard that, and uh, a lot of it had, I, it was explained to me at one point, and school me if I'm wrong, it was explained to me at one point that it was because of uh, the, I mean, the extreme separation and years after, you know, families had, had you know, uh, more and more offspring, that it was seen as a very American thing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just, and because geographically, we don't interact with a lot of other countries other than Canada and Mexico. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> Weird phrase. YMCA. No Way before village people turned this institution into a cheesy disco anthem, and long before the YMCA swept across America, the Young Men's Christian Association was the brainchild of English philanthropist George Williams. Dismayed oh, cool. by working conditions in 18th century London, Williams conceived the now famous charity as a safe place for its patrons. While the movement's worldwide influence is something to be proud of, difficult to imagine Williams joining in with the dance moves. You know, it's, I, I, I didn't necessarily think it was American. I know the song is, uh, is very American. Very from the United States, I guess. Um, but I never, I, I, I actually did not know what that that the YMCA was, you know, specifically uh, American. Although I can see that a lot of Americans would take that because that's 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 what we do. We take credit for a lot of things. <laughs> it's sad. It's very sad, but it's true. It's true. Now, and not very very many Americans have even left the country. Great chocolate bars. I think I'll eat it now. <laughs> Candy bars are big business stateside, but before Mars, Hershey's, Milky Bar, or Baby Ruth, there was one bloke in Bristol making confectionery history. Joseph Fry finalized the first mass produced chocolate bar in the mid 1800s, around the time that the Dutch developed a chocolate press. Fry's chocolate cream hit shelves in 1866 with a famed fondant filling, and the bar can still be bought today. Really? John Cadbury quickly followed suit, while the likes of Hershey's didn't arrive until the late 1890s. Yeah. Number seven, Santa. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I well, first of all, by the way, I did not know that. But uh, uh, as a matter of fact, to be to be completely ignorant and show you, how, I guess how honest I am, uh, I really thought it was a a, a Swiss. Swiss created things. It just is, just so happens that Swiss, I don't know, are associated with chocolate. Um, when I think of it, but um, that's interesting. Uh, we do have we do have a lot of uh, experience when it comes to uh, our our kind of chocolate here in the states. Apparently, it's it's considered like a lower quality chocolate. And um, there's a guy named Milton Hershey started Hershey bar, uh, the Hershey bars. It was actually taken almost. I hate them. What, what would you call it verbatim or exactly um and and used uh here in i'm in pennsylvania so not too far away from here 
And of course, just like every other American, made an amusement park out of his uh, basically city that he founded. Um, but that's very interesting. I, I think it's neat stuff to know. Sandwiches. Could I have a glass of wine? Okay. And a, and a ham sandwich? <laughs> if you like. With a pickle? <laughs> All right. Thanks to world-conquering fast food outlets, Homer Simpson and Joey Tribbiani, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this <laughs> food stuff was a US creation. However, the history of the sandwich is long and complicated, and very little of it happened in America. True. While early versions are recorded across Europe, it's named after the fourth Earl of Sandwich in Kent. Yeah. The story goes that he was an ardent gambler, and meat between bread was the simplest way of eating without disrupting a game of cards. Sandwich for display purposes only and should not be eaten. <laughs> Number Honestly, I don't think. Yeah, okay. So these are things America stole from Britain. I guess I don't know if we eat more sandwiches or or when we call them sandwiches, not sandwiches. It's very interesting how we change the words. But um, yeah, we don't. Uh, we did. I don't, I don't think many people think that we actually started it. Started the idea of a sandwich. Um. I could be wrong, but um, I don't, wouldn't say either stole. I would say, let's, I mean, you guys are, are you know, uh, when I, as the British, you guys are, are brothers and sisters, basically kind of the way most people my age see it, I think. Uh, we were grown up that way as, you know, as we're very, you know, closely related. We're probably your more outspoken a <laughs> family member that you don't want to invite over for uh, a birthday. But, um, yeah, we do, I guess, take a lot from you guys. And... Six, The Office. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. We did and take yes, The Office. We mean the TV show and not the actual open plan workplace, which is largely a German invention. Anyway, unlike a lot of American remakes of British TV, The Office US did manage to tap into most of what made its predecessor purr. But after nine series and a shed load of awards, let's just remember where it all started. Steve Carell's Michael Scott is hilarious in his own right, but for fans of the British original, he'll always be David Brent in disguise. <laughs> Number five. That's true. That's a great one to point out. Um. I actually like both of them. I think they're great. Uh, I have, I guess I, I have a preference to the American one only because, um, and I've thought about this uh, another time a while back. I had a conversation about this with a number of people. We were just talking about, because it's, number one, it's, it's supposed to take place. The American office is supposed to take place also here in Pennsylvania, just like Milton Hershey. Um, and it's not far away from, from where I live. Uh, so the people in this particular area do like the, uh, American version of the office, but you cannot deny that it is a fabulous, fabulous, uh, show from Britain. Um, when you, when you look at the British version and you watch it and you're like, oh my gosh, the characters, yes, I know where they came from now, 100% stolen. Plastic surgery. Wow. Ooh, that came out of me. From Botox to boob jobs, America is the world's leading market for cosmetic surgery, with millions going under the knife every year. But the industry was by no means born in the USA. Sir Harold Gillies is often credited as the father of plastic surgery, a New Zealand-born, London-based surgeon who gathered mm -hmm. leading physicians to treat thousands of soldiers who had been injured or disfigured in World War I. Gillies' work mm -hmm. became a blueprint for all sorts of reconstructive procedures, and a starting point for today's aesthetic options. Number four. That is amazing. I, I, for some reason, I did not put that together. Um, I mean, I, I figured it had to be based in war. That seems at least kind of obvious to me. Um, maybe not to everybody, but that's, that's, uh, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I guess we, we grabbed that one and took hold of it. And, of course, turned it into fucking fabulous <laughs> for everybody that can afford it. The light bulb. A supposedly serial stealer of other people's ideas, Thomas Edison's oh no. light bulb moment is considered one of the most significant steps in modern technology. Hey Edison, how about sharing some of those light bulbs, huh? <laughs> hey, figure it out for yourself, man. No, he but didn't. Experts come... are continually divided on just how much Edison did to develop the design. Before the Wizard of Menlo Park, 
there were countless other scientists creating electric light and light bulbs, not least British pioneers including Humphrey Davy and Joseph Swan. The anti-Edison camp claims and that the inventor's no only skill was knowing when to patent. One thing yes. Edison did invent for a 100% genuine Edison invention that we use every day, probably, most of us. Is it uh, nasal hair clippers? Number three. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, uh, yeah, Edison was, um, and, and Americans do not, Americans really do not like to, uh, you know, we, we sort of, um, we hear what we want to hear. Thomas Edison is an American, you know, scientist that changed, so, or, you know, uh, inventor that changed all sorts of things. That's not the truth. Uh, ideas based upon other ideas. Um, there were patent races. There were ideas that you wanted to find. And there were a number of different people trying to figure it out, such as the telephone and, you know, all sorts of things in the age of inventions. As a matter of fact, we had, uh, it was like a world's race. We had a world fair uh, in Chicago. Uh, where we would hold things like that. And then we would actually, I, I don't want to say we, but uh, people who were there, which were mostly Americans looking at world ideas, would take a lot of things um, and perfect them for their own. Um, so anyway, let's get back into it. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> now I sound Canadian. Donuts. One little bite won't hurt you. Now, the origins of the donut are a sticky affair, with claims and counterclaims sending historians round and round in circles. Okay. However, while a stronger suggestion remains that the Dutch took the treats to America in the mid-19th century, a 2013 discovery seemingly proves that the Brits were baking them at least 50 years before. Baroness Elizabeth Dimsdale's cookbook dates to 1800, and includes really? a strikingly similar recipe. A deep-fried concoction of sugar, eggs, butter, and yeast, add some icing, and it's the real deal. Number two. You know, I, I would have thought that would have been French um, because they're, well, at least my understanding is that they're extremely large in pastries. At least nowadays they are. Um, but uh, interesting. Interesting. Very good. Um, I don't want to keep apologizing, but sorry. Baseball. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's A from, national sport and yeah. obsession in the U.S., baseball was born in the U.K., there are countless records of bat and ball games being yep. played in Blighty, starting with stool ball in the 1300s. They're called sure, rounders, the rules I have think. changed and refined over the years, but the basic premise is usually the same. Someone pitches, someone swings, others yep. try to catch. In fact, some researchers argue that baseball is an offshoot of cricket, yeah. an English obsession which didn't catch on across the Atlantic at all. <laughs> Number one, the star... Okay, uh, yeah, that... Uh, um... Yeah, cricket uh, is is basically is the basis, I think, of the idea. But um, roundabout, we used to before before it was called baseball here in the states. I mean, we just we would play something called just stickball, and to me, it seems like it wouldn't necessarily be just a British thing. It would be like what kids do if they have a ball and a stick, you know, throw it at, it, try to hit it, but. Um, yeah, but I mean, cricket was probably the first offshoot of that. Our Spangled Banner. Oh, yeah. A Spangled Banner. <laughs> God, don't show that. We finish with a final salute for great British influence on American culture, because the US national anthem is sung to the tune of an 18th century English drinking song. Yeah. Baltimore wordsmith Francis Scott Key takes full credit for the lyrics, but the mm -hmm. melody was written by John Stafford Smith, a Gloucester-born composer. True. The anacreontic song, as it was originally known, was regularly belted around a prestigious London gentleman's club, where wealthy people met to wine and dine. Oh, by the way, the American flag is... I don't want to say loosely, but look up... If you get a chance, look up... Um, oh, what is it? The Hudson Bay Company flag? Very similar. I don't think that's a coincidence. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm I'm almost positive it's not a coincidence, um, from what I understand. So uh there is that. What did you guys think? Um I I, I think my I think that's kind of uh about right. There's so many more things, of course, but I don't know that they're the top ten. I think that they are just ten things. I mean, you could go back to 
you know, uh, some people think that, like, you know, the, the, I don't want to say lesser educated people, but maybe people that don't understand uh, things quite as well, they think, like, like the Americans invented democracy, like we're the only ones who came up with it, you know, or something like that. Very weird stuff. Um, but, you know, not everyone's perfect, uh, and certainly us Americans are have our fair share of imperfections. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. I always appreciate your comments. Uh, feel free to uh, subscribe, like the like the you know video uh, if you liked it, or if even if you didn't, and uh, feel free to share it out. All right, take care. Have a good one, and talk to you next.